and thank you very much for um, agreeing to listen to me uh, this morning. I'm going to try and, um, perhaps some people would say not uncharacteristically, shake things up. Um, I ought to explain that I've done two roles for uh, about 27 years. I've been an academic and I've also been um, one of the um, principals in Methods Group. So I stepped back from Methods Group um, uh, a few months ago and I'm now, of course, free to uh, speak my mind a little bit more. Beware a supplier who's had 27 years of being polite and is freed up to speak his mind. So I'm going to try and do that. Um, not because I'm a rampant egotist, but because I'm passionate um, in my belief that I think we've got to up the wattage in digital transformation of local public services. Um, and I'm going to hopefully be a little bit challenging about that. I'm going to use the analogy of Heart FM, um, and we'll see where that goes. I'll probably draw on a couple of examples that I'm proud of over the years I've spent at Methods to illustrate my points. Um, and uh, I'm going to try and keep the, the kind of take-homes relatively simple. So my role now is Professor of Digital Economy at University of Exeter Business School. That's relevant because I guess I, I'm not a technologist. I'm not a techie. I'm, if you like, a tech translator. I look at it from a business perspective and increasingly challenge tech-driven narratives that say it's all about our next product release or about the next technology that we're going to build. Okay? I want to consign a lot of that thinking to the bin. And, and basically, the trajectory of technology, the way that tech is evolving, means that we should all, I argue, and you're going to hear a lot of opinion from me, um, we should all start to consign, let's build our own version of this stuff, technology-driven narrative to the bin, okay? despite the fact we're talking about digital transformation. So this is my little group. We're called Index, which is Initiative for the Digital Economy in Exeter. Ugh. And we're actually based in London. Um, and we're a little group of people who are similarly uh, passionate about, uh, about um, tech, but the business implications of tech. So um, I sit awake at night and worry about this stuff quite a lot. I publish stuff, um, a lot of stuff around in government journals is one that's actually free to download if I haven't bored you all to death by the end of this morning. But you can see if you look at that title, Platform or Technology Project, and it compares different uses of, of platform technologies in governments around the world and then zeroes in on the UK. So I've got a kind of serious research angle. It's not just invective and opinion, um, although there is quite a bit of invective opinion in my history. I published a book called Digitizing Government with a couple of co-authors about, uh, I don't know, seven years ago. And several years ago, a manifesto, which kind of sorts up the wattage. You'll see um, at the bottom here, we reckon, this is from the press release, uh, we reckoned at the time we could transfer at least 46 billion, billion pounds. And I'm going to come up with a, an example of that later on in the talk, in case you think that's hot air, to the front line of public services, if we can start to really get our act together about digital platforms and sharing and cooperating uh, across our back offices. And that's really what my, my kind of talk is about. So as Suraj said, open standards and connectivity um, and how we, how we start to bring those together. And this stuff is, is not easy, I get that, but nonetheless, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't actually accept that challenge, okay? So I'm gonna try and bring that, that thinking um, together for you. But to begin with, just, just, just a kind of uh, a baseline, if you like. I know I'm talking to people again this morning, and I talk to lots of people in local government all the time, that BAU is, is, is where we're at, right? We're just recovering from COVID. We've had an enormous quantity of work to get done just to actually repair some of the damage that's been done to our public services. I know this, okay? So in beating everyone up in the room, I'm not being unsympathetic. I do realize that. Okay, but nonetheless, structurally, we are in a massive hole, aren't we? Before we even get to, to some of the more, you know, who knows whether we've got a government by the end of today. Before we get to some of the kind of uh, the current situations that we've got. This is a book I quite like. Um, and I particularly like the, the phrase here. The internet has revolutionized every industry it's touched, right? From newspaper to retail. So what on earth makes us think in local services that we're any different? Just because we don't go bust, and actually we are starting to go bust, aren't we? Um, if we fail. Why on earth would we think we are any different? So it's a revolution. That's what I'm going to be talking about. I want to up the wattage. I want to talk about radical transformation because I think there won't be any public services left in 15 to 20 years unless we do something a little bit more ambitious. 
And whilst we're sitting in halls like this, twiddling our thumbs and saying, well, you know, yes, we could, but it's got the BAU and, and there's a new chief exec coming in next year, so we'll have a strategic review and we'll think about it a little bit longer. There is a lot of suffering out there. We know this, okay? But it's just as well, before we launch into what we do about it, to rehearse that a little bit. These are affecting people out here in Birmingham who have rubbish lives because collectively, not, not individually, but collectively across local services, we are not working together and we are failing them, in my opinion. I told you I was going to uh, be, be freed of uh, the necessity to be polite, right? It's no one's individual fault, it's us as a collective. We are failing. So I think that's a problem. And it's not going away. Those, those slides were from, from uh, I think, last year. This was obviously, we see this stuff all the time, but let's just remind ourselves. This is the context in which we're talking about technology and transformation. Okay, this was two or three weeks ago. Um, and, and, and it's not just, of course, um, uh, local public services. It's, it's healthcare as well. Um, we've got, and it's not just in, in, in England, it's Scotland as well. And I think DLUHC, and I know there's a team here from DLUHC, and I keynoted uh, during the pandemic, DLUHC's um, uh, away day or, or online. And uh, again, one of the things I wanted to say, but I couldn't say back then, is if DLUHC, as the only department normally in charge of collective policy in local services, is not front and out there and leading this discussion, what on earth is the purpose of DLUHC? I mean, I don't understand what, what the purpose is of having a government department that is for, for all of our councils if it's not actually leading us, helping to lead us out of this prisoner's dilemma syndrome where we are all basically replicating the wheel again and again and again. And of course, the structural position has really changed, hasn't it? Because there's been that 17% or what it was cut in central funding, but of course that affects the poorest people the worst the metropolitan districts, that red line, the bottom there. Because, of course, those councils who are less able to raise those funds locally suffer the biggest, and I think it's up to 40, 47%, whatever it is, in their actual real, their real funding ability. So this is hideous. I mean, it's an appalling situation, I think. And it's all the more appalling to me because I'm increasingly coming to believe that we can use technology to solve it. And that's the argument I'm going to try and make um, uh, during the next few minutes. So there's, there's tons of it, right? I mean, there's just on we go. It's, it's incredibly depressing. But the reason I put all this stuff up that we kind of know is because hopefully it helps to establish the argument that just carrying on with BAU at the kind of pace individually at council levels that we have been is just not an option. How can it possibly be an option when this stuff is going on? So I think using this rather cheesy gif, the, the cracks are appearing, right, in, in our kind of collective ways of doing things. I just cannot imagine that there will be local public services in anything like their current state if we carry on at the speed we are. I just can't imagine that, that, that to happen. And I, I put this thing up because I did some policy with, with this guy about, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 years ago. We did a bunch of things like G Cloud, open standards, open data policy, um, SME friendly um, technology environment, all sorts of policy initiatives, which actually, um, I argue, helped to establish the kind of landscape that we are, we are procuring and using technology, government technology in now. I'm going to make the argument in a second. I think we've lost our way, um, but I'll come back to that. But I also think that he was wrong. He was wrong in offering citizens a choice between higher taxes or more cuts. Because I think there is a third way. I do. I think it is radical transformation of the way in which we organize ourselves. And I'll explain what I think that is in a second. So there is an alternative to that. I think actually we could have our cake and eat it. Which is hopefully a more optimistic message rather than the depressing messages I've been giving you so far. So, OK, so how am I going to structure uh, what I'm going to talk about? I'm first going to explain how, in kind of business school terms, we talk about legacy local services, or local services being a legacy sector, and what that means. I'm going to try and unpack what that means, and hopefully to encourage us to move away from just being buried in the tech and our next tech procurement to start to think about what we think our jobs are, what we're trying to do here. So I'm going to do that. On the back of that, I'm then going to engage in a bit of futurology, OK, so I understand that stuff isn't going to happen tomorrow. I've been around in the sector, like many of you, for a long time. So I'm not naive about it, but I nonetheless think that people need to stand up and at least have a vision. 
So I'm going to outline that, that vision. So there's, there's two things, really. And then finally, I've got one simple slide, which is, going to, which is going to kind of roll that up into two challenges for hopefully everyone in this room, whether you're a supplier or whether you're a public servant. It doesn't matter, in my opinion, anyway. So that's it. So I'm going to describe the legacy stuff. What, what does that mean? How do we got our heads around the problem? And then I'm going to talk a bit about maybe what we can do about it. OK, so let's dive in. Are you happy to dive in? Do you want to get rid of me? I we'll bored you. OK, let's see. Let's see what happens. Let's, st <laughs> let's start with another book. I highly recommend this. I don't know if, has anybody seen this book? It's written by a physicist with a brain the size of a planet who works for Harvard, and he's a kind of he's an astrophysicist. And in his spare time, he's written a book about artificial intelligence. I mean, oh, oh. it's the kind of person professors like me just, you know, ugh, ugh, hate him. Anyway, I also massively admire the guy. So there's the book. Now, this is a a photograph of my copy of the book. So you can see a map here. Uh, it's, so it's supposed to be a kind of map. Uh, don't worry about the stuff at the bottom. So you can see kind of mountains, can't you? And you can see some oceans at the bottom. And this is obviously, for those of you that keep up with this stuff, that, that, that you know, the pace of, of automation and artificial intelligence and, and, and the kind of the move towards general, general artificial intelligence is accelerating. And as it does so, of course, a whole bunch of activities and of course, I'm going to move this into the business domain in a second, that used to be needed to be done by humans, increasingly are going to be done by machines and are being done by machines, right? Process automation, OK? The simplest form of AI, if you like. So this stuff has increasingly been done by machines. So if you play chess, if you play this game called kind of Jeopardy, uh, if you drive, if you do translation, um, arithmetic, anything to which you can attach an algorithm is going, if not already gone. And this, this map, of course, is speculating about those people who are maybe the safest. Their jobs are the safest, if you like. So, you know, cinematographers, book writers, scientists, the people designing the AI until the AI gets smart enough to design itself, of course. And, you know, Stephen Hawking, before he died, an ex-colleague of mine at Cambridge, I guess, you know, he said he thought the greatest threat to humanity was not climate change, <coughs> it was AI. So, you know, let's not laugh. But I want to think about what this means for our local public services. So let's have a definition for legacy organizations. My definition is nice, easy definition. It grew all their people, processes, and tech before the rise of the modern internet. And I think of, as a non-technologist, I think of the modern internet as pipes, plumbing, that enables us to share pipe stuff around and share stuff. It's about sharing stuff, isn't it? It's not about having my own cake and scoffing it all myself. The internet means that we can now share things. So let's just hang on to that as we build this up. So legacy organizations grew up, their people, processes, and tech before that, before the ability to start to share stuff. And that's a central challenge to legacy organizations around the world, public, private, and third sector, is you can now share stuff using tech. What does that mean? for how you spend your time and how you justify the public value of how you spend your time every day. Well, so I think what it means for government is between 30 and 50% of people, processes, and tech, and what they do, and all their advisors, and the whole industry that supports all that stuff are moving underwater in that map over the next 20, 25 years, literally. It's an enormous problem. It's so huge that no one really wants to engage with it. And we're not having, if you like, the political leadership to really have that conversation and engage with it. So my challenge, given that, is do we really think, as local government practitioners, that in 30 years, have I said 30 years here? No, 2030. Are our council structures and our supply structures really going to look like they do now in 2030? Are they? Actually, let's just have a bit of a straw poll. Who thinks that the industry for local government, including council, organization, and suppliers, will look broadly the same in 2030? OK, so probably about 10% of people think they look broadly the same. Of those 10%, could I ask, who thinks that's a good thing? <laughs> OK, OK. All right. So. In that case, what on earth are we doing about it? Because I don't think we're doing really, well, I won't say we're not, not doing nothing about it, but we're, not, we're doing very little collectively at a strategic level about that. Where's that vision coming from? So what do, we, what do we think we're doing when we get up in the morning? And most importantly, we've seen with the launch of Crossrail, we've seen with the investment in kind of, you know, rail services, and, and there is a political appetite for large public infrastructure projects. 
But where is the political appetite for large public digital infrastructure projects? And most importantly, what kind of local public services, digitally enabled public services, are we building for the generations that follow us? What, what kind of mess are we bequeathing to them? Because there's no doubt it is a mess at the moment. There's no doubt. I think they're completely dysfunctional. <clears throat> if you were an alien and you, 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 you sort of hovered over the UK and you had a look at how we, as, as a species, collectively organise our public services, you would basically see that we are cutting all of the things that we all care about. That less doctors, teachers, social workers, daycare centres, parks, libraries, um, you name it that we're cutting those, okay? So anything that, you know, we go out in the street there and we ask about, they're being cut. And yet, we are still presiding over this extraordinary legacy of people, process, and technology from the previous century, when we had to build all this stuff individually and locally ourselves. It's absolutely mad. 430 local authorities, each surrounded by health, social care, police, ambulance, third sector, and housing organizations. They just provide local services. Citizens don't care which of those legacy organizations those services come from. They just don't care. 168,000 charities, 1,500 social housing providers. I was talking to a, a, a kind of a, a similarly-minded social housing chief exec the other day who estimates that between 30 and 35% of the entire, the total social housing budget in this country goes on back office drag, right? back office stuff that, that has nothing, little or nothing to do with social housing. Wow. He points out that if it wasn't for the quasi-public status of those organizations, they'd all go bust. And in fact, the private sector is sniffing around that because the private sector could run those organizations and, and get, that, you know, get that cost, that operating cost, down to 8 9%. So, so it's, it's monstrous, really. As a university, OK, I know how appallingly run most of our universities are, the rubbish service they provide for, for teaching, for research, and the enormous activity that goes on just kind of, uh, you know, keeping the lights on and propping up the various silos and, and, and fiefdoms that we've got. So it's ridiculous. You, you would never, I mean, would you, if you organize this way, if you were designing the system now? Of course not. So collectively, we're engaged in madness. Really, I mean, I think genuinely we are spending between 25 and 35% of our total local services budget. It might even be higher, might even be higher, on non-value-add activity whilst busy cutting more and more frontline services. <laughs> That's why, personally, I think our generation, unless we come together to do something more radical, should feel ashamed about what we're handing on to the next generation because things are just seem to be getting tougher. This is a slide I'm quite fond of. Uh, this chap was a, a previous chief exec of the NHS, <clears throat> and this is him saying he thought that the NHS spent 14% of its entire budget on this nonsense. Now, that's a treasury figure, so you can disbelieve it, right? Because, of course, the actual amount of money, public funds, that we spend on propping up this completely bankrupted industry, and for an industry I believe it is, is far too politically sensitive to actually agree on. OK, I think, it's, I think it's double that. I'll come back to uh, making, uh, illustrating that in a minute, a bit later. So my point is, if you like, when we look at our own industry and we look at the rise, the march of advanced cloud-based technology, OK, so technology that's based in the cloud, services that we, that we configure, we don't produce ourselves, we just literally consume them and bolt them in and let them do the heavy lifting for us, whilst, of course, enabling us to share. We want all of our data in the cloud. We want our services in the cloud. We can operate on the data using the, the heavy lifting of those services, and we can share, OK? That's basically the logic. So where in our activities are we just paying jeopardy, right? What are those things in, in our councils and other public, local public services that are, frankly, a shameful waste of public money? Where are we just playing jeopardy? And I think if, if you are in a, in a senior role in any council, that has to be, that has to be the thing that one lies awake at night about. I'm borrowing from um, a brilliant, utterly brilliant, I think it still remains utterly compelling and brilliant, three and a half minute video by a chap called Mark Foden. Who's seen this? It's called The Gubbins of Government. Some of you will have seen it. It's been around for eight, nine years. The Gubbins of Government. Do Google it, three and a half minutes. 
okay? And he basically tries to explain what we've all got to do. And I think it's brilliant. People who can communicate complex ideas really, really compellingly and simply, I think are worth their weight in gold. So, so Marx, I don't know what's happened to him. He sort of seems to be off the, off the circuit. But he did this video, and it's out there, the governs the government. He basically says, this is what we look like. If you look inside your council, there's a load of stovepipes, aren't they? And we don't share stuff. And it's no one's fault that we're like that, because the people, processes, and tech looks like a big spaghetti mess, big plate of messy spaghetti. It's all interwoven together. We can't unpack it. We can't share anything. And most importantly, that produces a logic where we look after our own uh, organizational structure rather than actually citizens' needs. We can't come together about, around citizens because we're too obsessed with running things the way that, that, that you know, we, we've inherited. I think it's a, a blockbuster, and to, to quote, uh, who was it who talked about blockbuster um, uh, health services in a Netflix world and then couldn't justify it? It happened a couple of weeks ago. One of our senior politicians, anyway, and then couldn't justify what he meant. <laughs> well, I could justify it. I think it's literally an old kind of stovepiped version which is focused on the organization's convenience rather than a cloud-based version which has all the heavy lifting does up there and focuses all of its value on the front line. Because what I think we need is more doctors, teachers, nurses, daycare centers, social workers. We need more public servants. Unfortunately, we all need less people like us. OK, so public servants are people who serve the public every day, face to face. They can never be disintermediated by technology. The public would like more of those. I would like more of those. I don't particularly want to be cared for by a robot when I'm 85, a plastic pal who's fun to be with, OK? I'd like a human. There is, in, there is elastic demand for public servants to, 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 to support us. What there isn't demand for is lots of managers and administrators, or at least those who aren't necessary or who are even getting in the way of the kind of reorganization I think we need. So I do think, for uh, these list of reasons, I'm not going to go through them all, we have to be radical. I don't feel like I'm on the kind of lunatic fringe of this stuff anymore, unless anyone's got a better idea. Just carrying on, you know, I've heard this on the Today program this morning, you know, carrying on doing the same thing when it's not working again and again is a sign of madness. And that's kind of what we're all doing, I think, collectively. So what on earth can we do about it, particularly with the acceleration of cloud utilities and services. It's a, the opportunity cost there, the missed opportunity to reorganize ourselves radically and not just cut massive costs, costs massively, but have more public services and to deliver those public services in a smarter way is just increasing all of the time we're sitting here twiddling our thumbs. Here's another piece of, uh, of, of strong opinion. As one of the people that was involved those 10, 12 years ago in trying to reorganize the sector <clears throat> okay, around open standards, I've been disappointed, and, and I've been public about this for years, <clears throat> with a direction that, if you like, the digital community took. Okay? So it took this direction. GDS was very, very successful, government digital services, in lots and lots of ways. Okay? They modernized. Public, the, the public service technology profession, they introduced agile working practices, they communicated user-centric digital service design, they did all those things brilliantly, and they won awards for it, and rightly so. Unfortunately, in my view, what they also did, because of that success, <clears throat> is they generated a sense amongst many, if not most councils, and across most of government, that what you need to do to transform digitally is get a bunch of funky guys and gals like that, have lots of post-its, lots of bunting, lots of cake, talk about open source, okay, and build stuff and bang on about user needs. That's good modern technology practice. There's nothing wrong with it, but it is not digital transformation of the business. And I think history has, I'm afraid, borne that out. Nothing wrong with this. It's been very successful. It's not their fault that they were very successful doing that. It's our fault, if you like for misinterpreting that as digital transformation. Now, I won't get into some of the, again, pick up the, the academic paper. I, I flicked up a bit earlier. I can share these slides afterwards. I get into some of the details on that. But it's led us, if you like, even further into the mess. OK, and I started talk calling this out back in 2014. You see up there? I wrote a piece saying, searching for the signal of open standards. That's the, that's the kind of um, platform I've always stood on amid the growing noise of agile. We were losing sight 
of what we're actually trying to do with digital technology. And we're all just retreating, forming our own little digital groups and saying, let's build services. Again and again and again and again. Madness. I think it's madness. Again, I think an alien would think it was madness, who wasn't invested in the kind of culture we've got. To borrow a slide from Mike Bevan, um, AWS crew, um, it's a bit like segueing, segueing the cavalry. Okay, why would you do that? Okay, so, well, that's a lot of criticism, isn't it? So, uh, Mark, can you come up with any ideas then about what we ought to do about it? Well, funnily enough, um, yes, I can. So I often talk about Heart FM. The reason I talk about Heart FM particularly to local authority audiences is because I know, and I feel for all of you, I know that you have to deal with the localism agenda. All right? So every time you try and talk about adoption of common standards and common ways of doing things, you come up against localism. We need local things for local people. Okay? That's a, our local people deserve better than vanilla. Okay, we want to have a nicely configured thing for local needs, okay? And that's right, but the thinking is wrong, okay? And the reason it's wrong is that if you standardize your back end and have your data in the cloud, increasingly you can do a far better job of configuring those things around local needs than you can possibly do by trying to reinvent your own version of the wheel all the way down, okay? And the reason I talk about Heart FM is because they prove this point. So Hard FM is a regional, middle-of-the-road radio station, right? So there we go. I've, this is the screen scrape from their website that shows that their regionalism, okay? So Hard FM is their Birmingham, uh, or whatever the county is. I uh, can't see it here, actually. West Midlands, maybe. All right, so if you tune in to West Midlands Heart FM, you get local DJs, local advertisers, local revenue models, local weather, local traffic, local gossip, local, local, local stuff for local people. Hooray! Except, of course, Heart FM isn't daft enough to insist that they have a special Heart FM West Midlands office with a Heart FM West Midlands CRM and finance system and process management system and content management system and all the rest of it. They're not daft enough to, why would they do that? Because when I tune into Heart FM, I don't go, yeah, the, the weather in Birmingham is gonna be sunny today, but I'm really bothered about the CRM system that the radio station's using. Who cares any more than your citizens care about this stuff either? So of course, the digital content management system, the back office, it's just streamed from some tin shed in, who cares? I don't even know, I don't want to know. Most of it, I bet you, is probably in the cloud. But it proves, it proves the point that you can deliver locally configured sub public services that will conform with your localism agenda while standardizing your back end. And indeed, you can release more funds to do a better job. Okay, so that's why I kind of like the, the Heart FM analogy. And I think it's a good, it's a good comeback, okay, for frankly ignorant um, responses to people who are trying to modernize local government who say, well, you can't because you can't have standard backends because of the localism agenda. So that's the response, I would say. And just to drive that home, I also talk a lot about a principle called focus and leverage. Okay, so imagine, imagine you are in a policy room, okay, and you've got a supplier, or maybe you've got um, someone who works for you pitching you an idea. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna picture it as a dragon's den scenario. You're dragons and you're all sitting there with your pile of cash. We've all seen, seen dragon's den? Yes, are you, are you all still awake? Yes, good. So you're sitting there with your piles of cash looking, looking typically grumpy, right? And I've come in, I'm really nervous and I'm pitching you my idea, okay? In the last century, you would, adopted, you, would have, you would have really focused on, thought about my focus, my proposed focus, what I propose to spend your money on. And you make the judgment as to whether to invest on a traditional bunch of things, right? So do you like my, the cut of my jib? Have I done my research? Uh, you know, do I, do I appear compelling? Is the idea, does it stand up? Has it got legs? You know, all the traditional ways that you evaluate policy. Except, of course, now, with cloud-based utilities and services, that's not enough, is it? Because, of course, what you don't want to do is burn through 95% of your pile of cash just reinventing the wheel before you get to the bit, the magic bit, where we actually do something new that people care about. Okay, you don't want to do that. And you certainly don't want to be burning through public cash reinventing the wheel before we get to the bits that citizens care about. So actually, I talk about this as being, you really want to know from me, I've got a good idea, 
But also, how am I proposing to stand on the shoulders of giants and not waste public money do, building a crap version, frankly, of what exists out there? How, how, is my th how did I start with one idea for a public service and then cycle iteratively back between focus and leverage again and again? So once I realized the sorts of technologies that I could turbocharge my focus with, my public my service, I then redesigned the service to incorporate those. And you want to know that I've been around that cycle several times. Because otherwise, you're going to be doing the equivalent of, of you know, the building a data center or, or you know, in the era of cloud or whatever, right? It's, it's nonsense. So I, to distill it all down to a principle, a takeaway for, for, for you, that's how I, certainly, I, you know, I get involved in Dragon's Den scenarios, and that's how I evaluate everybody from students to businesses like that. What's your focus, and how are you leveraging emerging technology to turbocharge that, right? And how, have you, and how has that, in turn, modified your understanding of what you're trying to do? Okay, focus and leverage. Does that make sense? Yeah? Great. So here's an example of focus and leverage. I think it's brilliant. If you bought one of these Jaguars in about 2012, you're actually buying a Ford Focus because uh, Jaguar is owned by Ford, and they decided, you know what, people who buy Jags, and I won't ask if there's any Jag owners in the room because they probably won't own up in a minute, uh, it's typically middle-aged males of like, bit like me, and they want to kind of get in a sort of a you know, powerful car, vroom, vroom, they want to hear that big engine, and they want... Uh, endangered wood species of, you know, on the dashboard and that kind of gentleman's club feeling inside. And they just love the buff of that, oh, the buff of that, that paint on the front, right? There's, there's a whole load of things they care about. That's the focus. How much do they really care about the wire that connects the speedometer to the engine? Do they ask questions about that when they're in the showroom? No, of course they don't. Okay, they just leverage that. That's standard. That's a standard part. So Ford kind of realized this. They, they realized there's a bunch of things in this build that our customers care about. Okay, and there's a whole load of other stuff they don't care about. So we'll just, we'll just use, reuse focus parts because they don't care. They actually got caught out because a motoring journalist who had just the day before reviewed a Ford Focus took, this, took the Jaguar out and noticed that the switch gear looked exactly the same as the Ford Focus. So he blew the whistle. Now that's fair enough, so they got, they got found out. But what I think, that's, I think that's actually a good example of management practice because they were listening, because as a result of that, they basically changed the switch gear because they realized that customers cared about that bit. They still carried on sharing the drivetrain and the brakes and the wire connecting the speedo to the dashboard because it added no value to their customers. Just think about the plethora of activities in local government that add no value at all to our customers. So I think, that's a, I think that's a great example. They got found out, but then they responded. And it should be an iteration. I, I argue that in this kind of scenario, businesses need to do that check, do that kind of test, do that listening to the market every six months. Okay, what are the things that we value and what are those things that we can leverage? Moving closer to digital, I think this, as a result of this, is an excellent example of user-centric digital service design without going down the GDS uh, agile, let's build it all ourselves in-house route. Okay, so TransferWise, I used it the other day. I think it's just changed its name to Wise. Okay, I like this website because it's clean, it's simple, it's user-centric in that it's worrying about what I'm worrying about. So when I, when I want to send money abroad, okay, it's worrying about my worry, which is how much money are you going to take? How much money is actually going to get to the recipient? So I can type that in, it tells me immediately. Brilliant. Okay, I don't have to enter my details or send them an email or whatever. It just, bang, it's thinking about my needs, my user needs. And also, I of course, I want to know how that stacks up against other people in the market. So they've thought of that too. Brilliant. I love it. I think it's a fantastic piece of user-centric digital service design. However, part of the reason they've been able to concentrate on my user needs is because they're not, half of their brain isn't, based, isn't taken up with reinventing the wheel. They're not burning through that pile of cash on a load of nonsense because, of course, if you look, look at it, it's, it's all based on currency cloud. Currency Cloud Direct is our white label payments platform built using APIs to give you a complete out of the box payment solution. Because they've realized that, again, when I'm a, when I'm a customer here, I'm not, uh, what I want to know is my money arrives losslessly and safely and competitively. And that's it. I don't care what the back end is running on, providing, it's, providing it meets these criteria. I don't care. So I think that's how you do. You can, you can focus at the front end and leverage, leverage the back end.
Just another example for you, which means, of course, that if you're Western Union, which is a legacy organization which has been around for over 100 years, that does it all itself, I think it's a terrible website because I've got to register. It sends me, sells me nothing. It's got a nice picture on the front, but it tells me absolutely nothing. It's not anticipating my user needs, but then they've got a back-end cost, operating cost drag that's colossal. They're a legacy organization. I would be very, very worried indeed if I'm Western Union, if I saw something like this. Again, if I was running Western Union, I would be lying awake at night. Why should we be, why, what are the things that we need to be the equivalent, we need to be lying awake at night at um, in local government? So I think there are some things we can do about it. There's some high level things that we can do about it. So if I was, a, if I was king for a day, who knows where the government goes, I might be by, the, by this evening. Um, <laughs> This is, this is a, a, a spoof parliamentary bill. I did a, about 18 months ago, um, and I shoved it up. I was on a train, actually. I put it up on the train, and it went viral briefly. And I got calls from people in GDS, people in Scottish government, people, senior digital people in the government going, Christ, Mark, I've just seen this bill. Where do you get it from? Um, I've got to, I, my team have got to be all over this. I mean, we've got to make announcements. Like, what's, what's going on? And of course, they hadn't read to the bottom. It says spoof parliament and kind of the basis of... <laughs> But it basically says, this, this is what I, you know, on the principle of show, not tell, I was trying to show people what if we could legislate and we had some proper leadership that was competent about the level of change that we need, what you do. And, I, and you can see, if you look at you know, localism, as defined in Localism Act, used to be an appropriate response, but it's not anymore. You can read it for yourself, right? Since 2011, the acceleration, proliferation, and maturing of digital economy means loads of powerful new admin services can be consumed cheaply, very, very cheaply, and at scale. And of course, it does these wonderful things. Center services around citizens, shift resources to front lines, share data to, to join up, upgrading automatically, benefiting from crowdsourced innovation, all those things we are not doing at the moment. And as a result of that, the purpose of this bill would be to say, actually, DLUHC would start to take some more policy leadership and would actually say to chief execs, you know what, we're going to redefine localism so that you are, you are free to, to be local and have choice and agency over those things that add value to do locally, your focus. And the leverage stuff we're going to take away, a bit like the way that, uh, that Ford did with Jaguar because citizens don't care about it and it's holding us back. That's what I would do. But of course, I'm not king, so I can't do that. But that's, I think, what the answer looks like. And, and, and the sooner we get there, the sooner we get there, the better. Of course, meanwhile, we can do at the, at the meso level, we can come together in, in initiatives like the Local Digital De Declaration or the Jardu Library. Okay, so we can start to actually share software upgrade paths, strategies, APIs, code libraries, uh, process diagrams, uh, architecture. We can start to share that. And we can start to tell our suppliers, don't come to me and sell me a slightly different salami slice version of the same thing, because I'm already in touch with this council over here, and we're going to converge. We're going to start to converge those standards across our back end. And actually, there's been now, I think, about 230 councils that signed up to that. I had some involvement in the, in the genesis of this. So I think it's, it's heading in the right way, but it's not nearly fast enough and it doesn't have nearly the right leadership and support at the level that this, this change is going to require. So, so high level things we can do, medium level things we can do, and again, policy, I had a hand in, in writing a piece of this a few years ago, this piece here. So this was a, a GDS um, uh, digital transformation strategy, and you can see across all government we develop an ecosystem of reusable components. This is my, my moment where I can mention Lego, Lego, so that they can be used together to quickly and easily deliver new or improved services. But it's not really happening. It was just it turned out to be just, just a document, which is disappointing because we all got very excited in this cabinet office room when we were putting it together. Um, Scottish government's done something similar. So um, I think drawing on a, actually a paper I wrote up here, uh, here's a recent um, requirement specification, well, it's two or three years old now. Look at this, but I love the way that they've communicated that. This is the Scottish government communicating to its supplier community. I won't read it, but look at those things. Those things in the bullets. It's basically saying the Scottish government's telling its suppliers we're gonna stop buying again and again and again, different versions of the same thing. 
and the DEU, the digital unit, is taking a new approach. Instead of focusing on differences and boundaries, we're saying, what have we got in common and how we can commoditize and standardize that, which was our kind of policy aim 12 years ago. But it kind of took a bit of a, got blown off course, I'm afraid, by the GDS kind of digital um, uh, adventure. So that's another example, because those things are just like Lego bricks, right? Now we're starting to get down to the kind of level that we're all familiar with, and yet we're still reinventing this stuff. These things should not be difficult. They're exactly the same things, by the way, as power our universities, or um, uh, housing organizations, or charities, or, or the NHS. I'll come on to the NHS in a minute. <laughs> it's the same stuff. We're just making such a meal out of it. Shouldn't be hard. Should be much, much more like hard. So again, what have we got to do? Back to the in inside councils, we look like this, but also between councils, we look like this at the moment, more or less. And what Foden did that I think is so clever is he said, okay, so, so let's look at that, let's chop it up a bit. We've got levers and dials, so that's the kind of, a, that's the website, that's the touch point, the interface with citizens, okay? That's relatively straightforward, although we still make a bit of a meal out of it sometimes, relatively straightforward. And then we've got the machinery, so that's the, that's the pipes and wires, that's the infrastructure, that's the commodity stuff. Again, that's the mechanical stuff. The thing that we, as business, digital business leaders, have to get our heads around is the stuff in the middle, which, which rather endearingly just called gubbins. And that's the process logic, that's the process layer. That's the actual design of our departments and what we do in our services. And those are difficult because, of course, using my language, there's some specific bits of that, what I would call focus, where we add value, where we really do need to configure stuff locally. But increasingly, lots of bits of that process logic are common, what I would call leverage. There is no excuse to waste precious public funds on reinventing the wheel and burning through that cash. And so the kind of the job of work to be done for all of us is increasingly every time, every time we face a technology choice, every time we face a piece of policy design is to go, okay, I'm going to spend money on the levers and dials or, or making sure it looks compelling and the specific stuff, the focus. But don't come to me and sell me a product or service that's just basically reinventing any of the stuff in red. I'll be pushing back on suppliers to do that but also pushing it back on our own people. This isn't a public-private sector thing. This is all in it together. Because increasingly, a lot of these cloud technologies and services live in the private sector anyway. Quick example, a couple of examples for you, and then I'm going to start to wrap up. So uh, this is something about four years ago, <clears throat> uh, just an, ex my, uh, an example from my own experience. Uh, I live uh, near Tewkesbury, about an hour away. And uh, my local member, who's in charge of technology, who doesn't really know that much about technology, um, met me in a pub and he said, Mark, can I have a chat about, about technology? You know something about technology. Um, we've just been quoted over £100,000 for a new website by a consultancy that I won't mention. And he said, is that, is that enough? <laughs> should we spend £500,000 on it? Or should we spend £100 on it? Just no idea, really. OK. But at least he came to ask. And so, so we asked some, I asked them some questions all about that focus. And it turns out that Tewkesbury has you know, it's a very simple, small council, non-transactional requirements. Um, it's really, really very simple. Okay, most of it is just publishing, really. So, so we whittled it down and down and down. And you can see the results of that kind of pushback, that challenge on focus and leverage, which is that so we spend 150 quid a year on our on their website. Yeah, it, cost, it cost a few thousand to set it up, and after that, 150 quid a year. So you can, and admittedly, that's a simple scenario, okay? And I understand we don't all operate in those scenarios, but it's an example, it's a concrete example of what that means. So I want to draw on two, before I finish, two other concrete examples I'm proud of that during my time at Methods I had some involvement with, um, just again to, to bring it to life for you. And they're both examples, I think, of that that other, you know, another way of expressing the same challenge. Are, you know, are you, when you do your technology decisions, when you design your public services, really just, just digitizing, you know, digitizing the cavalry, right? Segwaying the cavalry, as Mike Bevan would have said. Are you just really just dumping a whole load of legacy processes that have non-value add online? Because it's a waste of time and you're letting down future generations if you are. Or are we actually, and this is the most important thing, the use of digital technologies to change a business model, to actually change what we do? And we know that's harder. 
because there are jobs, there are careers at stake. There are entire departments who have to change what they're doing. And like all organizations, public sector is no different. That stuff is really hard. It's the people stuff that's hard. It's not the technology. But do you see how often, and I think partly led by the, the sort of post-it agile uh, lot that say the digital is all about that, we've, we've, we've drifted into a technology narrative where we think digital is about technology. And it's not about technology. It is and it isn't. It's not really about technology because the technology is becoming more and more vanilla flavored, more and more standard, more and more powerful. When was the last time when you logged on Google that you asked what version of Google you're running? A stupid question. It just works, doesn't it? And that's how most of the back end of our public services need to get. There is no public justification, in my opinion, for running different. I really don't believe there is. So are we digitizing or are we digitalizing? OK, so what does it mean? A couple of examples. So here's one. Apologies to the methods people for having seen this millions and millions of times. So we did some work with Swindon Council. We had a particularly brilliant digital designer um, who helped us, um, who's, with the, who's no longer with the business, but we're still very close to him. And digital, uh, uh, Swindon Council had a, had a kind of a typical gds -y way of going about it, right? What's the user need? Which is good, OK? That's definitely the right way to go about it. So they had. Fly tipping, like we've all got fly tipping problems, deal with lots of these incidents per month. Um, citizens get very irate about it. it, it destroys the local community, that kind of degrades it, and it's a big problem. But it's also very expensive, because as we all know, you've got to separate out the different types of waste. And citizens don't really want, they're not very specific when they, they, they call or they, they text and they go, you know, sort this horrible pile of crap out, please, okay? And uh, they don't say there are three fridges and there's one bit of garden waste and there's a bit of, right? They don't do that. So that's really expensive because we've got to go and collect it and sort it out and, and we're not doing a good service. So rather than saying, I know, let's, ha let's start a, a digital project where we're going to start to you know, talk about use needs and build a whole load of stuff, which is basically building a next generation of government legacy for future generations to sort out. They said, well, OK, let's take a Lego brick approach. What do we need? We need some OCR, some NLP, some geolocation services. We need some uh, artificial intelligence, and we need some web services to plug it in to our line of business applications. Okay, so we need. So what do they do? They strap some cheap cameras to the front of bin lorries, council assets, going round and round all the time. Okay, and they were uploading, uh, uploading street scenes all the time. Just happens, you know, when we're all asleep, whatever. And they, they started to, and then they pumped that through some optical character recognition to start to look at the enable the cloud processing to start to you know, dist distinguish items on, on the, from the pixels. Natural language processing, obviously, some of the clues if it says Samsung on it or Zanussi, it's probably a fridge type of thing. Um, geolocation, machine learning to start to then identify these types of things. And the clever bit was that then the, what that then did was it then separated out these undifferentiated piles of mess, right? So it said, right, there's a, there's a fridge over there, there's a fridge over here, there's a freezer over there, there's a washing machine over here, and when we get to a truckload, like 10 or whatever it might be, then we dispatch our white goods supplier to go and get rid of it. So all that happens like that, without doing anything. And it happened, as I understand, it was made real for a handful of thousands of pounds in three months. That's what we can do. That's what I call digitalization. It's not digitization. It's not taking whatever broken service we've got and, and digitizing it. It's rethinking. It's using the idea that we can leverage all of those standardized Lego brick components, if you like. And if we put them together in a smart way, we can do something amazing. And it was amazing, I think. So it, and here's, a, here's a sort of a, a, a shot of it. The interesting thing is we then we then repurposed that service pattern for other things because the council wanted to sort out potholes, a similar user need, if you like. Where is a problem on, on the road network? What do we know about it? Where is it located? And what's the appropriate response? And so that was some stuff that did the, the length and the breadth and the depth of potholes. And then I think we re, they repurposed it again because during COVID, there was a similar generic service pattern. Where is there a kind of problem? What do we know about it? Uh, and what is the appropriate response? And can we triage that a bit? So this was about citizens who, who um, felt very vulnerable during COVID and who wanted to share data about their vulnerability, but not to everybody. 
Okay, so again, is it possible to start to triage that and to dispatch responses and respond accordingly? So you can start to reuse service patterns that have similar combinations of Lego bricks, which I thought was interesting, and it won a, a, a it was the highest public sector scoring, it came third, um, but the highest public sector AI Innovation of the Year award. The final example, and I'll shut up because I can see Suraj standing there looking nervous, is, uh, can I talk about this one, I'll yeah, shut up? Okay, so this is, this is what I'm now gonna spend the next few months of my life doing. I've become progressively obsessed by this thing called NHS jobs. So I'll just briefly tell you the story about it, and hopefully if you're in any doubt about the weight of what I've been talking about, hopefully this will set your mind at rest. So NHS jobs is something that Methods was involved in 20, uh, in 2003. Okay, so 2003. Uh, NHS Jobs, by the way, is, is, is the e-recruitment system for the, for the NHS, which is Europe's largest employer, okay? So, so when I go and see a doctor and they go, what do you do? I say, have you heard of NHS Jobs? And they go, yeah, it's brilliant, I love it, it's great. You know, it's always been there, fab, okay? So that's, and it's 100% take up across the NHS. So, it wasn't always like that, okay? The NHS, like our councils, they've got 650 NHS trusts, and they're much more bigger and more powerful than most councils, right? These are big organizations, as we all know. 650 of them. And the scenario was that they all did recruitment locally. They all did it in a vertically integrated way, right? So they had their own agencies bleeding them dry. They had their own recruitment departments, their own recruitment processes, people processes and technology. All of that, so you can imagine this huge cottage industry just replicating recruitment 650 times. And it did a rubbish job, of course, because if you're a doctor or you're a nurse and you're in Birmingham and you want to see if there's a job in Newcastle, you have to go and buy nursing times Northumbria, right? So there was no national visibility either. So it cost billions and it did a rubbish job, okay, 650 times over. So the DOH noticed at this point that there was this new platform, this new idea called JobSite, a job board, right? That 2003, the first job board sprang up and there's one called JobSite. And Department of Health did what I'm entreating all of you as a result of what I said not to do, or at least to think very carefully about doing because it did the government knee-jerk reaction to that, which is to say, oh, that looks nice. Let's, let's hire IBM or somebody and pay them 100 million pounds to rebuild that and have a, let's have a pu public sector version of that. That's, that's good, isn't it? Let's focus on the technology, that'll do it. So they put out a, an invitation to tender. And Methods at the time was very, very small. We're, we were in a little room at the top of a building in Covent Garden, and we said, are you happy to have a non-compliant discussion? In other words, we think you could do it a better way. Are you happy to chat? And to their eternal credit, they said, yes, come in and talk to us. And we said, you could do it that way. Problem is that IBM then walked off with a 100 million pound check in their pocket. You're left with a piece of legacy, the new legacy piece of government technology, and you've delivered zero value to a single doctor or nurse. Because of course, you then got to persuade 650 very bolshy, powerful, intransigent, um, set in the ways NHS trust to abandon all of their ways of doing that and to consume it down a web browser like Google, which is how it's done. Yeah, so, you've got to put, so, so how are you gonna do that? And why don't you use the market in a more intelligent way? Because that's the main risk, right? IBM get off scot-free and also, uh, you actually, you've just wasted, so, so uh, job site is 95% fit for purpose for the NHS. So by rebuilding it, if it costs you 100 million, you just wasted 95 million pile of cash before you get to the 5 million configuration that actually is gonna add any value to doctors and nurses. So you've wasted 95 million pounds and you're left with the risk of driving take up across the public sector. Total failure, that's what they were going to do. So we said, tell you what, we'll, we'll, we'll get into bed with JobSite, we're a service wrap, we'll reconfigure that, that 5%, so we've already saved 95 million pounds, and we will take responsibility, the risk, the business risk, not tech risk, the business risk of persuading take up, driving take up across the NHS, because we know, don't we, that platforms, platform businesses, take up is the only statistic that matters, right? That's why all of these from Uber to Rightmove to whatever they are, they all, they all beg for customers, right? We've got to have the same mentality in public services. So I've started this research. There was a lady called Lynn Saltmarsh and she spent a year on the road. She got around eight NHS trusts per week. And she's just saying, we'll give it to you for free, okay? They didn't have to pay for it, that was funded. So it was free and, and there was free training. Wind forward 20 odd years, it saved at least, at least 
14 billion pounds. Not million, but billion. It's now our, talk to anyone in the public service, they love it, it's part of our national infrastructure. It's had those savings, okay? And it's achieved 100% take up. Why can we not do something like this with a lot of the non-value add services that soak up our time and our energy in local authorities. That's my leaving question. And in, in government, we know we say we like to pretend we love innovation. And the next question is, where have you done it before? And how can it be risk free? Well, this proves it. And I'm going to try and spend time getting the numbers right, getting checked by the NAO. And then I want to go more public about it. Because it proves that we can, actually. It proves that what I'm talking about isn't just academic waffle, that you can actually do it. So final, final slide. Are you just caretaking a broken model, given everything I've said, given the fact that we're heading, to a, you know, heading for a wall at the moment, public services are dying on their feet, and the technology, the opportunity to do something about it at the back end is massively accelerating. So are you just doing BAU? I get why that might be the case. Believe me, I do. Or are we having the right conversations all around in our community? So I think it's not evolution, I'm afraid. I think we've, to, to save the environment in which we work for people who depend on that, we need to do better.